very cool. <laughs> So welcome, Kevin. Um, this is uh, first in a series that we're doing um, for my NYU e-commerce class. And uh, it's great to have you on. I uh, look forward to uh, your presentation. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Kevin Iwaki. I am a software engineer and now uh, e-commerce marketplace leader. Uh, I've been doing tech startups for about the last 12 years or so. And uh, I guess this is sort of like my history in, in one slide. Um, started off in web startups as the founder and CTO of Step Out, which was a social dating app back when you could start a social dating app. This is before Tinder. And, um, and basically went through Techstars, learned a lot about starting web startups and eventually sold that to IAC. I've been sort of a startup engineering leader in the Techstars portfolio for the last 10 years or so, and have done everything from sort of managed teams to being an individual contributor myself, uh, ran a data warehouse group at Simple Energy for a little while. And um, over, the, over the course of that time, I hired 45 software engineers to work at the various web startups that, that I worked at. And and basically, it was the insights of being a player coach and working on uh, on Gitcoin, or I'm sorry, uh, at these companies that led me to starting Gitcoin, which I would describe as a double-sided marketplace that connects uh, coders to the type of people that that want to hire them. Um, and and if you're someone who's an employer, then access to coders is really important for you as you're building a digital product. So. Um, You'll see the Ethereum Foundation on, on this slide. We do a lot of work with them. We're a pretty blockchain forward project. And I understand that the sort of e-commerce stuff that you guys are doing, York, has a little bit of a blockchain bent, or at least it will, it will today. Um, and uh, we've also done a couple of virtual hackathons with Microsoft. So I think that that's how York and I have gotten to know each other and, and got to work together with placing some software engineers on some of the projects that they're working on. And um, yeah, so uh, this is a special class for me to be to be speaking to because I lived in New York City for five years when uh, when I was running stepout.com. We were based out of Union Square. And so I'm based in Colorado right now, but have spent a lot of time around the NYU campus and lived in the East Village for five years when I was in my 20s. So uh, it's fun to be talking to a class at, at NYU. You guys have some really smart smart students there and I know that because we had a uh, an intern that worked at Step Out for a few years that that was a computer science student. So um, I guess uh, York before I continue I'd love to just inquire about the nature of the sort of like blockchain bent because when I hear e-commerce and blockchain those things are like it's like oil and water I'm not exactly sure how those things fit together. Yeah there's actually um, I think the class will tell you that I probably talk about blockchain more than they expected. Um, okay. But it, sort of the, um, there's a couple of different angles. Um, there is a payment section, which um, for the last seven years that I've been uh, teaching the course um, has always had an alternate payment vehicle um, in it. So that's actually my introduction to blockchain actually came from teaching Bitcoin as a payment vehicle uh, okay. uh, before, I, before I really knew anything um, about what it was and, and really wasn't interested in, in it for for quite a few years, just because it was, you know, something that was very simply, uh, you know, viewed as a as a payment vehicle. Although today I would probably not say that, right? Um, yeah. Um, and so that's one angle. The other angle is um, uh, uh, unique item uh, identification, uh, as okay. an example, right? Um, for supply chains, uh, is an important angle around, um, you know, uh, goods provenance. Um, okay. Right, so it's a sort of a supply chain example, which we do talk quite a bit about in okay. uh, e-commerce because if, you don't, if you're in a physical supply chain e-commerce mm -hmm. business, you can't do e-commerce without understanding your supply chain, right? Um, right, of course. Um, as, yeah. as we can see, right, every single market uh, today, uh, whether it's Amazon or um, uh, stores is impacted by supply chain uh, issues. Right, uh, okay. 
Um, so, so there's that. Um, and then um, we I talk a little bit about the theory of money as well. Um, look, sort of um, harping on um, different international experiences with money. Uh, also looking at um, uh, what a lot of people in this class um, from Asia will be very familiar with is like how WeChat uh, is leveraging uh, payments um, to create interesting, unique experiences. Okay, got it. That's super interesting. Um, yeah, so that gives me a and sense lastly, of- Last, last okay. point, um, last point, sorry. <laughs> um, actually, the um, I encourage students to use a uh, blockchain-based e-commerce marketplace as part of their final project um, as an mm. alternative to using something like Shopify. Um, so in the past, folks have used um, um, Open Bazaar, um, Open C, um, uh, and you know, so that's something I encourage as well. Um, you know, as a way for people to sort of get some sense of what's going on in the space. Got it. Okay. So just to get a sense of the class, and I've never done this on, on Zoom before, so mm -hmm. please please humor me. How many people have actually broadcast a, blood, a blockchain transaction before? Either show of hands or just say something in the chat, if you don't mind. I'm seeing one person shaking their head no. It's probably pretty low, Kevin. No. no? Okay. Cool. <laughs> I'm just, just sort of wondering. Um, it, can, it can seem daunting until you've done it, but then once you've, you've done it, it's... Uh, in my opinion, at all, not all that hard. Um, and, and then I guess the other question I have for for your students before I move on is is you know what are you trying to to get out of this class? Are, are there some of you out there who are going to be starting e commerce businesses at some at some point? Are you just kind of trying to brush up on your digital skills? If you wouldn't mind just putting into the chat what you're looking to get out of this lesson or, or, or the class in general, that'd be useful grounding for me as I continue on in my presentation. And also I'm realizing, York, before I continue, that uh, you have a really cool virtual background so that I should probably put one on mine before I, before I continue my presentation. So I don't know if anyone else is a Star Trek fan, but we're gonna give this presentation from the bridge. <laughs> I, I, I want to see you do a better job getting like right into uh, one of the seats. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, maybe uh, if things keep going virtual, someone will develop the technology for it. Um, so let me give you a, a little background um, on, on the class. Um, so uh, Victoria works for an agency, so she's very well versed in uh, digital, various different forms of digital marketing. Merce has done uh, quite a bit of design work. Um, so understands that category. Um, typically, a lot of folks um, in this course have one or two goals in mind. It's either to go work for an agency doing something in digital or e-commerce um, or a brand um, doing okay. something, you know, it could be brand strategy, it could be digital, um, or um, there's often quite a bit of interest in um, uh, people who are looking at their own businesses and, or their own startups, right, and trying to understand um, okay. how they can apply, uh, you know, some different types of uh, learnings. Okay, great. That's good to know. Well, I don't have any experience um, working for agencies, although my wife was in advertising for um, the, at, at the time I met her, but I do have plenty of experience with startups. And it was sort of the experience in, in these startups that led me to one of the core insights of, of Gitcoin, which was that everything that I was doing with the work that I'd done in startups was built off of open source software. So uh, open source software is really this incredible device for launching a startup because you don't have to you don't have to have a you don't have to build a web server, you don't have to build a database server. And you get so much out of the box that that you can reuse from other people who have built great software. And I think that you're really standing on the shoulders of giants when you're building a startup or if you're working at an agency and built, delivering a project for them. And, and and so open source software, actually the stat is that it provides billions of dollars of year a year of economic value to the economy. I think 400 billion was the stat that, that we pulled uh, a few years ago. And so, um, one of the crazy things is that software developers are all building this software for free and giving it away for free. And, and so it just seems like there was this asymmetry to me between the amount of software, the value that open source software was creating for the world and the value 
that software developers who are working on it were able to capture. And so this is one of Gitcoin's core missions is to build a world in which open source software is sustainable economically to maintain. So we want to build a world in which uh, everyone on our platform has the financial leverage to leave their jobs if they want to. We want to make it as easy to find work in software as it is for an Uber driver to, to find a ride today. And hopefully we can align incentives between both sides of the marketplace to, uh, to, to make sure that it's a win-win for both sides of the marketplace. So uh, the, the product that we launched with is called Bounties. And so basically bounties are a way for, if, if you need something done, let's say you're working at your agency and you need some, some sort of feature developed or you need a bug reported uh, or, or a bug fixed on, on software that you're working on, it can be really hard to find a software engineer to work on that, on that problem. And I know because I've been at parties where people have those problems and they'll sort of like pull you aside and say, hey, can you help me out with my project? I need someone who's really technical. And I just found that there wasn't a really great way to meet really smart software engineers and to work with them really quickly. And so that's why, that's why we built Bounties. Um, it's basically the, the use case is that if you have a feature that you want to develop or a bug that you want fixed, you can attach some cryptocurrency to that, that feature or bug report and then post it to Gitcoin and then Gitcoin will market it to the 30,000 software engineers that we have out on our platform. So um, this is actually what I'm clicking on right now is a bounty that, that I just posted. We're using Gitcoin to build Gitcoin, which is a whole level of meta and dog fooding, which I, I think is kind of fun. But um, basically I posted a 60 ETH bounty which is worth about $7,000 for someone to help me build a feature on Gitcoin called personal tokens the other day. So basically the, ver the flow of this is, is that we're going to see people who are applying to work on this issue with, uh, with, with me and they submit their work plan to, to the Gitcoin bounty. And then I can, as I can go back and forth with them about what I think is a good idea and what I don't think is a good idea. Eventually we build the software and then I pay them out in the crypto tokens in exchange for the work that, that they did on, on the platform. So a uh, very, very uh, s small step towards accomplishing our mission of, of growing and sustaining open source software. And the idea was that you don't need a recruiter to find a software engineer to work on, work on your digital projects. And that's one of the value propositions that, that Gitcoin provides for, um, for the double-sided marketplace that, that, that we've built. So basically, um, again, we're a double-sided marketplace that connects coders to the people that, that want to fund their work in open source software. And if you're an employer, you get value by having access to, to over 30,000 software engineers that, that we have on the Gitcoin platform. So that was what we launched with. Um, one of the things that we, we, we learned though, um, as we were building the Gitcoin, the Gitcoin platform was that uh, there's multiple ways to skin this cat. There's a, um, uh, I, I know because I've hired 45 software engineers in, in my 10 year, 12 year startup career, that uh, there's several steps that you go through when you're looking to, looking to bring someone on board. So there's the, the source step. So basically finding all the possible software engineers that are out there to work on your project. There's selecting the people that you actually wanna work with. And I think that this is actually a really important step, especially for the young minds on this call. Uh, you wanna work with someone who has good communication skills, who you're able to, uh, that, who, who has good technical skills and who is excited about the project that you're working on. And the difference between a software engineer that has a lot of experience and good communication skills and someone who doesn't uh, is, is, is quite vast. So helping people select software engineers to, to, to work on their projects and then, and then sell them on, on their projects. That's also an important step because we're in a world where everyone needs software engineers and knowledge workers to build digital projects. We've got a digital economy. And so if you wanna get an edge in, in, in internet and e-commerce, then selling a software engineer on your idea is quite an important step. 
And then lastly, onboarding them to make, to, to make them productive on your product and then retaining them to, to work on your product. And so one of the things that we very quickly, that we very quickly learned after we were working on Gitcoin was that, was that Bounties, which was the first product that we launched with, was only really the tip of the iceberg in terms of, um, in terms of what we could be doing in term, in, in, with respect to, to helping software engineers. So Bounties, and um, you know, we started marketing them as virtual hackathons, our way to pump 1,000 software engineers per month through the entire funnel of, of, of engaging with, with, a, with a knowledge worker. So source to select, to sell, to onboard, and, and maybe you'll get to retain with a couple hundred people if you do a virtual hackathon with us. But uh, shortly thereafter, I got hooked up with, with um, Eric Berry, who was also working on a similar issue of, of uh, growing and sustaining open source software. And he, uh, he was working on a project called CodeFund. And uh, CodeFund is an ethical ad network that delivers over a million impressions per day to software engineers that are, that are looking for, for new projects to work on. And so Eric and I got to talking about how we both had this mission of growing and sustaining open source software, but he had a, um, a completely different mechanism through which to do it. And that was ethical ads. So basically this is the code fund landing page right here. And you can see that up here in the top right, there is a, uh, an ad up here for that, that's powered by code fund. And so if you're a software developer who's trying to monetize your audience in, in software development and you wanna make some money off of them, you can put up a code fund ad. And the cool thing about, about the code fund network is that it is ethical ads. So I, I don't think that most people on this call probably know about ethical ads, but they're non-tracking uh, contextual ads. So that means that they don't place any cookies on your machine when, when, when you visit a website that has a code fund ethical ad on it. And we think this is a quite an important thing. Privacy is becoming a very apropos issue for a lot of modern internet consumers. And just the fact that if, if you have an audience that you wanna monetize, you can do that without selling out their data to Google and to Facebook, I think is, is, a, really, is a really important market uh, product to have, to have in the market. So, Basically, what we've done is we've we figured out that uh, software engineers need to find ways to earn money online, and they can do that through bounties, and they can also do that through ethical ads with another product that we have called Code Fund, which is uh, which is delivering over a million impressions a day to software developers, and is delivering about seventy thousand dollars per month to software developers across the world. So, kind of proud that we've built, a, built this company around the mission of growing and sustaining open source software, but we've got complementary mechanisms to, to accomplishing that goal. Um, let's see, so uh, York, I, I guess, uh, where would you like to take the, the conversation uh, from here? I think that you know, one of the things that you wanted to talk about was metrics and, and, and growth would, would now be a good time to get into that? Or do you like to stop for questions? Uh, this is my first time doing this. So you tell yeah. me what's, what works. Uh, great introduction. Yeah, let's, let's stop, uh, let people ask questions because I think we've covered some interesting ground. Um, uh, Two-sided marketplace is very common, obviously, in the advertising industry. Um, and uh, so you've got essentially a, a, a monet, you're sitting in the middle of the monetization engine of that, right? Um, yep, exactly. So. Um, we provide liquidity in the form of money on the uh, employer side and then um, inventory it with software developers on the other side and we kind of sit in the middle of that and then take a stake in that and that's how that's how we make money all right i'd love to take some questions from the class i've given lectures in front of real classes and it's always fun to see people raising their hands and asking questions but i understand that people are shy on zoom Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm working on the, the interactivity and the feedback mechanism. This is only, only the second class we're doing this way, so. <clears throat> okay. No worries. Um, 
So can you talk a little bit about um, how you think about some of the metrics that I mentioned, like average revenue per user, uh, monthly average users, you know, growth, et cetera? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the most important metrics in a double-sided marketplace is the amount of volume that's going through the marketplace. And so the metric that, that we track uh, at Gitcoin is is called gross marketplace value. So basically, uh, you can go to gitcoin.co slash results and you can see the gross marketplace value that's going through Gitcoin. One of the radical things that we're doing here is being very transparent about, about our, met, our metrics and how things are working on, on Gitcoin because I think that it sort of sets a tone for, for, for the marketplace. And so you can basically see that we've done almost $4 million in gross marketplace value on the Gitcoin platform. And I've been at this for a while. I've been working on this for three years and you can see that there's a cumulative effect of the effort to the, that we've been putting in into Gitcoin in that the marketplace value is really starting to, to reach almost half a million dollars a month, which I'm super, super proud of. So in February, 2020, which is the last full month that we've closed, Gitcoin facilitated 375K in value transfer, which is about $500 an hour um, for every hour during February or over $2,000 per business hour during February. So, so that's, a, that's a monthly number, 376? Yeah, 376K. Okay. So, um, you know, the, that's the top line number that we, that we track for the Gitcoin platform. Um, if, you're, if you're a user, you might be interested in some of these hourly stats. Like it, if you post a bounty, it should take about four hours to have the bounty started. It should take about seven days for the bounty to be turned around. Um, we've got 20,000 monthly active users, which uh, is an important marketplace, or sorry, metric for, for an online website. And I'll probably come back to that. Mm -hmm. um, bounty completion rate is about 80%. Hourly rates are between 20 and $60 per hour. And the metric that I'm most proud of is that we've helped almost 40 people find full-time jobs. And that's like lives changed is I think a, a pretty good metric to tell you that you're doing something that's, that's important to the world. So this, so summarizing here, so you've got like four hours until there's interest in a particular issue bounty. that you want to yeah. want to get work done on. Um, uh, seven days to basically completion after, after work is started. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah. And those are, that's a median stat, obviously, depending on the size of the bounty, it can really vary, but that's what the median numbers look like. So, um, these are metrics that are, that are really important to, to the users. Um, some of the metrics that, that, that I track that I want to tell you guys about um, from here are uh, one of the things that we've been working on a lot over the last uh, over the last couple of months is moving Gitcoin from being a an application that you would use a lot on a monthly or quarterly basis. Say you engage in one of our monthly virtual hackathons, or you engage in some of the funding rounds that we work on on Gitcoin on a quarterly basis. Well. Um, one of the things we really wanted to do was make Gitcoin into a tool that people use every single day or every single week of their lives. And so one of the, one of the features that we built was a, a set of social features that allow you to interact with people in a sort of like casual, fun, social, social type atmosphere. And, um, and so you can, basically, uh, you can basically see from these graphs right here that uh, the, those features have gotten increasing usage on the platform and um, it's increased the amount of daily active users that we have on the platform by, by quite a lot from around 150 per day to where we're at now at around 300 to, to 400 daily active users a day. So um, one of the good proxies for how important is your application or your marketplace to your users' lives is how many people are willing to come back on a daily basis to, to, to engage with your platform and to engage with people on the platform. And it's one of the metrics that, that we've been really focused on in order to show that, 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 we've, got a lot of, that we've got a lot of engagement. So this growth so, on the top chart is, uh, well, actually on the bottom chart also, is 
you think is very much attributed to the social features you've added? Yeah, I think that basically um, when we run a virtual hackathon, say with Microsoft, then you're going to see these spikes in usage, in daily active usage. Yep. And one of the things that we were trying to get better at, at is retaining people after those spikes in usage. Mm -hmm. So basically you'll see that we do a marketing event, whether it's a virtual hackathon or something else, and then we'll get a bunch more usage. And then our goal is just to level off higher than when we started that spike. Yep. So um, I, I'm actually curious. Uh, I, I'd really like to get into a somewhat more advanced metric with this class. And I wonder if anyone's ever heard of something called cohort analyses. Has anyone ever heard of a cohort analysis? Okay, well, I'm going to teach you about them now. And I'm really excited to because I didn't know about cohort, cohort analyses in, until about three years into my technology career. And so um, basically one of the ways that you can look at user retention in a digital environment is with something called a cohort analysis. And I know when I put this up on the screen that it can look a little bit scary and daunting, but I promise you it's actually really not that, that daunting. Um, so basically what we've got here, oops, is on the column over here on the left, you can see the signups to Gitcoin in any given month from when we launched in 2017 and we were doing about four signups a month to, um, early 2020 and we're doing over a thousand signups per month. Um, in the first month, everyone has come to visit the Gitcoin website. And then you have what's called attrition over time as people start to forget about your website or your website is maybe irrelevant to them and they don't come back. So this is called a cohort analysis because it allows you to visualize as users have been on the platform for a longer amount of time, are they returning back to the platform? And so you can see that, uh, you know, the real story with Gitcoin sort of starts in 2018 when we launched the Bounty platform. And you can see that about 10 to 15 percent of the users come back on any given month when we first launched the Gitcoin platform. So um, these are different cohorts that have signed up month over month in the three years that we run Gitcoin. And then as you go across the right, is how often they're engaging back through the site. So, so you can see- that basic monthly active users, actually. Yeah, exactly, monthly, monthly active users, but by different cohorts, you can yeah. sort of see how they evolve over time. And one of the things that we've learned over the last uh, month or so is that users tend to level off at about uh, 15 to 20% if they're an early adopter or seven to 10% if they're later adopters. So you can look at these little purple arrows right here, and you can kind of see where the users plateau in terms of their engagement. But, you know, I showed you on this previous chart that we learned that when we run really good marketing events that people re-engage and they stick back in the site. So um, what we discovered when we were looking into these cohort analyses right now is that you can see the marketing events that, that we've been running on the application if you just sort of uh, look at how they ripple through the cohorts in, in a sort of ripple effect. And I think, um, York, you and I, I think we did the first Microsoft Ethereal virtual hackathon together in, um, in around May of 2019. And you can right. see the effect of that event on the Gitcoin user base. We had leveled off at around 20% here and it's, it becomes 40% in the next month when May 2019 hits and we're doing this engaging event with, with Microsoft. Very cool. So this, is, this has been a really interesting way for us to figure out that we can get more engagement if we just create these really more, uh, the, these, these really lightning strikey kind of events. And it gives us a playbook for in the future. Okay, we're just gonna run more virtual hackathons, hopefully with Microsoft again. And we're gonna run more grants rounds where we're, we're sort of engaging the Ethereum community. So um, it gives me a lot of hope to know that we can move these metrics up into the right by, by looking at this cohort analysis. And I think that if any of you are gonna get into works with a, working with agencies or with startups, then you're gonna use cohort analyses a lot. That's a great tool. I actually had not worked with cohort analysis before. Very cool. Yeah, it sort of lets you know if you launch a new feature in a certain month, how it, how it affects both the new users and the old users, which is um, sort of really powerful. Um, the next metric that I think that I want to talk about, and I'll just have to speak to it because I don't have a good fancy graph for it, is, is um, ARPU and, and CPA. So does anyone know what uh, either of those metrics are? 
and like striking out on the on the crowd yeah. engagement here. Is it right. average time. revenue per user? Yes. Yes. Give it a little time, Kevin. <laughs> okay. There you go. <laughs> All right. So yes. we have we have a winner for ARPU. How about yes. <laughs> uh, C CPA is the other metric. Cost per acquisition. Cost per action. Acquisition. Uh, sorry. There we go. Yes. Thank you, Victoria. Um, yeah, so, so um, cost per acquisition and ARPU collectively are your unit economics for your application. And so um, cost per acquisition means how much does it cost you to acquire a, a new user to, to your website. And then ARPU is, is, I think it's kind of an unfortunate metric name because it sounds like a dog food brand, but um, ARPU stands for average revenue per user. And so basically if you're an investor in an e-commerce site and you're trying to figure out, is this a good investment for me, then it, it helps to have your cost per acquisition lower than, than your ARPU because then for every user who's going through your application, then you're you're generating more money than you spent on on acquiring the, them to come into your excuse me into your application. So unit economics are a really a really important metric to have down for your marketplace or for your e-commerce business. And um, particularly if you're ever going to do any sort of cost per click advertising on Google, Facebook, or CodeFund, then you're going to want to know exactly how long how much money it takes you to acquire that user. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a software engineer. And so I really like optimization problems, getting cost per acquisition down and then getting average revenue per user up has been sort of what we've been doing for a lot of the last 12 to 18 months uh, at, at Gitcoin. So I'll sort of pause there and take a breath. And if there's any questions on unit economics, let me know. What is your, uh, you probably had it on the other chart, but what's your average life of a user? Yeah, so um, the users plateau at about 12% uh, uh, coming back. And then we're, they sort of start to come back up when we run these, these virtual hackathon and, um, and, right. and grant funding events. But so I actually don't even... I don't even know what the average lifetime is. Well, I guess if I eyeballed it, I could I could probably say it's about three or three or four months. But the mm -hmm. ones that are stay engaged, stay engaged forever. So that'll bring the average out as right. you as you go out over time. And it's a it's a it's a effectively a freemium model, right? Like there's no fee for users to be on this for for you developer users to be on the site and be engaged, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, we we actually have put a lot of uh, a lot of kind of like freebies out there for users to entice them to join because we don't want to pay pay for marketing and users don't want to pay to to join a site like Gitcoin. I think that Facebook and Google and a lot of these other websites have sort of pioneered that users expect a website to be free. And so yeah, we don't charge anything for users to to join the application. We we charge when a transaction is made in the middle of the marketplace and we have a 10% fee in the middle of the marketplace. So when you start transacting, that's when, that's when Gitcoin starts to make some money. How does get, how does that 10% compare to other multi-sided marketplaces? What actually, let me ask a question first before this is not for you, Kevin, this is for the class. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the common multi-sided marketplaces that we've talked about um, before? There's many of them. Someone in the chat says eBay, I think. How about where there's inventory? Uh, we've had discussions about inventory, um, different types of inventory. Etsy, that's a good one. How about mobile applications that we use every day when we're not quarantined? <laughs> Things like was Uber. Shopify one of them, or no? Uh, Shopify is um, not not necessarily. I was thinking more like an Uber or Airbnb, right? Where Uber is matching, you know, people who need rides with inventory, right? Which is taxis, right, or cars, right, um, and drivers. 
and Airbnb is matching people who want to stay somewhere with people who have inventory, right? Who have bedrooms, right? Um, so those are multi-sided marketplaces and they take a fee, right? To be the market maker. Um, and that fee, does anybody know what those fees are approximately? It sort of it sort of depends on the marketplace, right? Yes. Yeah. I mean, I think Uber is close to thirty percent. Um, at least it used to be. It may have may have come down, um, but it's a fairly high percentage of the transaction fee. Um, uh, there's other marketplaces too, like the Apple Store, right? Um, or or the Microsoft. Um, you know, application store, those, those take a fee as well. Right. And I think, uh, probably around 20% still for those. What about like a, we work type model? Is that similar? Like leasing the space and kind of taking. Yeah. There, the share that way. Yeah. That's a, that's a, it's an interesting example. I, I, I mean, I think we work has, other nuances around like who owns the space, but um, certainly if they were 100% leasing the space and then, you know, on one side leasing a large space and on the other side leasing it out to individual office workers, yeah. um, that right, they are the market maker there, right? Yeah. One of the things that I think is quite interesting when you think about marketplaces is how defensible is your, your fee that you're taking in the middle of the marketplace. So. Um, you know, you, at, any of us on this call, given the enough technical skills and enough time on our hands, could launch a competitor to Uber tomorrow. But one of the reasons why I don't think that it would get off the ground is because consumers value convenience a, a lot. And they want to have a, a, a uh, well, well, you want to want a lot of things when you use Uber, but I think that you want to get from A to B safely. You want someone who can get there quickly and you want a decent price. And, um, and if you just don't launch a marketplace that would compete with Uber, then you wouldn't be able to compete with their network effects because you just don't have the, the inventory. So there's really an art and a science to building in enough inventory and network effects into, into your marketplace such that your fee is defensible. Um, you know, we're sort of at a point where we're approaching profitability and we can't pipe, you know, we, without outside investment, we couldn't pay our staff, but um, there's a certain point with a lot of these marketplaces, especially the ones that are web scale, where they really become quite profitable because they have these network effects that allow them to defend their fees. Um, have you guys talked about network effects at all, York? Uh, a little bit, not, not yeah. too much. So the way I would describe network effects is basically, if you remember, Gitcoin's a double-sided market. And so we have employers and people who want to fund software developers on one side of the market. And then we've got software engineers on the other side of the market. And so one of the cool things about the network effects of a project like Gitcoin is that every software engineer that joins the network makes it a little bit better for employers that are on the other side of the network. And every employer and funder who joins the network um, makes it a little bit better for every software engineer that's on the network, just very small incremental levels. But then when you start getting into web scale and you start to really um, spin your flywheel, then your network effects get so strong um, that it becomes very hard to compete with you because you've got so much inventory on on both sides of the market. And I think that for for marketplaces, that's that's one of the ways that you create a def defensible business. Yeah, I mean the the bootstrapping problem on a two sided marketplace is very challenging. Um, going from yep. you know no nobody in your marketplace uh, with no reason to be there. Right yeah. <laughs> to uh, sustainable um, marketplace that it has a growing network effect is actually quite challenging. Yep, it's sort of a the proverbial chicken and the egg problem. Yeah, how did you address that in Gitcoin? Well, so um, I basically built Gitcoin in my basement, which I, I'll take my uh, take my virtual background here so you can see where Gitcoin was made right here, <laughs> um, and. Um, and I launched it and it was only me and my friends who were, who were using it. And uh, I knew that I needed to take it to the next level and I knew that I couldn't, I couldn't do it myself. And so one of the, 
one of the things that I did was I pitched Gitcoin to Joe Lubin, who's the uh, founder of Consensus and one of the co-founders of Ethereum, the largest blockchain network, second, second largest blockchain network in the world. And so I pitched him and, uh, and somehow convinced him to invest in the project. And one of the things that came along with that in, uh, in, addition, to, in addition to some capital was the legitimacy of having Joe as an investor. And so we went from a place where Gitcoin was barely being used by my friends uh, to a place where MetaMask and Truffle um, and Microsoft eventually were, were using the platform. So one of the big ways that, that, you, can, that you can sort of pull the lever on, on getting that double-sided marketplace started is by starting with friends and family and then starting with your investors or starting with uh, people who would have uh, we'll, we'll give you the benefit of the doubt and try your products without, uh, w without, you know, without those network effects being there yet. And luckily, you know, Joe brought the demand side. Joe brought, brought people who were going to use bounties, Truffle, MetaMask, that really had a great brand name to them. And luckily, I've, I've, I know enough software engineers from my 12 years in, in, in startups that I was able to, to bring the supply side. So that's sort of how we got it initially off the ground. But uh, I mean, it's a lot of rolling up your sleeves and elbow grease to get a marketplace off the ground. I think when you first start. So you didn't you didn't use any incentivized offers or anything. Um, no, I mean, so we have experimented with like pay per click ads later in 2018, but those didn't really those didn't really work. Um, I have heard of people having success with like CPA type offers or discounts, referral codes are all, all good things to try also. Mm -hmm. I mean, this, yeah. is the, this is the same challenge effectively if you have um, a startup e-commerce business, right? It's how do you get people to know about your plat, you know, the, where you're selling, um, right? Without, yeah. any, without any built-in network effects, um, oh. which then so, allows you to, well, depending on what you're selling, right? Um, yeah. You know, allows you to then have legit legitimacy of why people should actually put their products on your site. Yeah, for sure. Um, this is actually probably a good time. Like, if we if we zoom out a little bit uh, for for the for the entrepreneurs in the room, um, we can kind of talk about the time before I started Gitcoin, which is actually prescient, I think, for for this group that um, basically, basically, I didn't know that building a blockchain startup could be a job back in 2015 when I first started trading Ethereum um, and, and Bitcoin. And so basically, I started working on side projects a, a, a lot. And um, this, is, this is an article about this project that I built called Adblock to Bitcoin. So basically what it did was it took Adblock ad space and it puts a QR code that solicits a Bitcoin donation onto onto the website and um i launched it and it like it blew up i got written up in wired magazine from the work that i did there and for a little while i was trying to build an ad tech company um i was trying to build a you know a, a crypto micro payment sort of network and it really didn't work like no one wanted it and so and so i i, I think that um you know, that and I, there's probably two or three other side projects that I started before Gitcoin. And I sort of launched a very small thing, realized no one wanted it, and then moved on and, and, and cut my losses from those projects. It was actually a really important part of setting Gitcoin up for success because there, there was just a, a, a tangible feeling when Gitcoin launched that it was something different and it was something that people actually had a demand for. And so I think that that's one of the key things when you're first starting to get the marketplace off the off the ground is really being able to measure measure that that tangible sense of people actually want this and it's going to be worth my effort to really be pushing this boulder up up this hill for one two three maybe maybe ten years and so you know I said it in the beginning of my presentation everyone needs software engineers right now in order to build digital products and that's one of the reasons why a new Gitcoin was the one. Very cool. And I mean, that also speaks to um, the value of two things. One, and we've, one of the, one of the sections that I teach is, um, I don't, I don't know if you ever watch uh, Kevin, a show called The Prophet. I've heard of it. I've never seen it. 
yeah, it's you should take a look. It's uh, very interesting because uh, it really focuses on this issue that you identified earlier, which is how do you ensure that you're actually making money, right? Mm -hmm. Your costs, cost of revenue versus you know versus um, top line revenue, um, yeah. uh, you know, and and all of that. Um, and it looks at it from a small business uh, perspective. So this is actually quite good um, instructive material uh, on on the web that you can look at, um, but sort of a, along those lines, um, uh, when you think about the businesses that you tried and, and moved on from, uh, I was actually going to mention that the the concept of an MVP yeah. or minimum viable product must have been pretty important. Yep, absolutely. Um, how long did you spend on those MVPs? Uh, yeah, so MVP stands for minimum viable product. Um, yeah. unless you hang out with people who play sports, then it's the most valuable player. But, uh, so there's always a tension between, uh, between, uh, viable and minimum, right? Because you want your product to be good enough that you can, that you put your best foot forward and that, that people will actually use it. And then there's a trade off with how minimum it is because your, your efforts could be potentially sunk costs on, on that project in, in, if, if, if it doesn't work out. And so you want to get to that next, that next uh, stepwise increase of enlightenment by, by putting in as, as little effort as possible. Um, I tend to start off with, with, well, back then I didn't, but uh, you know, back then I was just the software engineer and me would just build something and then put it in front of someone. Um, nowadays, what I, how I, I would approach that is actually doing user research. So talking to people that would be their customers about how they think about it, whether or not it's a big problem enough that they would change their behavior if, if you provided it a solution and sort of working backwards from who the customers are before I even start uh, start start breaking ground on, on building any code, which is for me as someone who's more comfortable in my office jamming on code was sort of a hard thing, hard thing to learn it to go out and do do some marketing but um that's that's sort of been the way uh york that that i trend towards keeping things as minimal as possible before i i launch them and that applies not only to new businesses that i'll start in the future but also new features that we're building for the gitcoin network do you do you do any kind of um user experience um flows after you've done those sort of cust early customer discussions yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I think that analytic, oh, so user experience flows after you've had those initial customer. Yeah. Um, just like, yeah. Um, you sort of validated that there's something there, but you don't want to go fully build it yet. Yeah. 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 So clickable prototypes are something, a tool that didn't exist when I first started in tech 12 years ago, and now they're really amazing. You can put your design into what looks like a website and you can tell it different areas that the user can click will take them to different pages. You can kind of map it up in a graphical user interface and put it in front of a customer without ever writing a line of code. And we do do some of that in order to visualize what's over the horizon for the Gitcoin network. And it's quite a good, good way to understand your user psychology before you, um, before you invest in, in the engineering cycles to, to build something. So definitely would recommend uh, clickable prototypes and, and flow testing. What customer? What, tool, what tools do you like for that? Um, so let's see. It's called. You can do that in Figma, right? Also. Yeah, I was just gonna pull up Figma and see if that's clickable. I think I'm pretty sure you can do clickable in Figma. Yeah, um, that's you know we have a designer on the team and she's the one who spends a lot of time in there, so I don't I don't actually know, but I know Figma is a, a tool that's taking off a lot. And your presentation materials, those are also Figma. Uh, the presentation materials were Google presentations, the ones from earlier. Yeah. But like the graphics in them are done by your designer. Um, so we're pretty big believers in dog fooding and believe it or not, Gitcoin has expanded from just software engineers into creatives also. So mm -hmm. those are all designers that I've met on the platform and they're really quite talented. I'm very happy to, have a professional looking deck and brand these days. Yeah. yeah, that's great. So you're paying you're paying designers on the platform to do that work. 
Yeah, I'm paying them in crypto. So um, if anyone, uh, if anyone uh, wants to earn their first crypto, if you want to go to Gitcoin and and send me a message on there, I'd be happy to send you. Well, I don't know if I'm actually allowed to to make that offer, but <laughs> um, Gitcoin's a great place to earn your first crypto in exchange for for doing creative work. And you have a founder a, and a founder a founder incentive. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's some people chatting in the chat here. He's not just the CEO, he's also a user. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta use your own product and otherwise, how do you know whether or not it's good enough that people should, should keep using it? Yeah, so uh, Merce, you mentioned customer journey. Actually, um, I'm setting up a, a meeting with um, uh, some of your guys, uh, Kevin, on customer journey because there's definitely um, some improvements that we can make in the, the chat and, uh, and, and, you know, virtual incubator space. For sure. Yeah. Um, feedback is a gift. And so I'll try to make it to that. And I hope that we can make it coin better for the next people who come along. So let's see, I think we have about five minutes left. How, sh how should we, do, should we use the time? What do you guys want to hear about? We could break into Q and A. Yeah, feel free to speak right up. Can you actually Special. talk more about um, ethical ads and like how those are designed? Yeah, sure. So Code Fund is our ethical advertising network. Um, we may rebrand it to Gitcoin ads at some point soon. And basically the way that those are designed is, let me share my screen real quick. So uh, if you go to codefund.io, you can see, see our platform. And so um, basically what this is, if you look into the source code, it's a JavaScript snippet that uh, displays an ad, but doesn't put any cookies on the user's site. And so because of that, it's, it's quite a different um, ethical experience from Google and Facebook, who are obviously building up dossiers on all of us 24 seven as, as we're using the web. And so um, basically from a design standpoint, we're, uh, we're basically, uh, it's a double-sided marketplace that has advertisers, uh, basically people who want, to fund, uh, who want to fund ethical ads, and then publishers who are basically software engineers who want to earn the money in the ethical, ethical ad platform. So um, I don't know exactly what, uh, Ashlyn, what area of design you're interested in, but that's, that's the basic product offering with, with ethical ads. Um, does that mean the ads are not tailored towards the audience? They're seeing random ads like Google native ads. Um, so Murr's really good question. The, um, so ethical ads don't track you as an individual user, but we can do what's called contextual ads. And so, you know, we're not, um, we're not displaying an ad for, for, for ovens on a software engineering website. Um, we're using the fact that you're looking at a software developer website that's focused on JavaScript to sell you tools and experiences that are related to the fact that you're looking at a website about JavaScript. So JavaScript books, JavaScript training courses, you'll see some Gitcoin ads on, on the CodeFund network when you, when you look at it. So no, they're not random ads. Um, it, they're based on the content of the site rather than the behavior of the user. Yes, great point, Lars. So are, are you, are you gathering any kind of, um, aggregated target user information to do that targeting? Yeah. So well, we'll track, we'll track, uh, impressions, click rates, um, aggregated information about geography, but nothing about your, you know, what, ex what you like on Facebook or the photos that you've uploaded, you know, nothing, nothing that's personalizable. So that's code fund. Ashley, let me know if you had any questions about that. I think you, you took us down the code fund rabbit hole. What's the, uh, the, do you have the, the network? Can you show the network experience? I mean, the, uh, where you log in? Yeah, sure. Um, how's the conversion rate? Um, so basically the ads go for about $4 in CPM. Um, where's, 
And um, the, you know, the conversion rate sort of just depends on the, the offering that, that you're building. So um, given that this is recording, I have to be a little bit careful about whose stats I show off. So let me find the Gitcoin stats. I'm probably allowed to show those. Yeah, so um, we have a whole advertiser control panel where you can go in and you can see the click rates for your properties and how many impressions that you're getting and, and all of that kind of stuff. And it's really full featured. I mean, you can manage your ads in here. You can upload creatives. You can, you can, you can do a lot of standard stuff that, that you could do in an unethical ad platform. So Blockchain for Social Impact Coalition as a website, um, would be, we'd be a good publisher for these types of, this type of ad network? Um, right now, our sort of sweet spot is people who are doing 25K impressions per month or more. But, um, you know, uh, happy to, to talk about that offline with New York. But uh, it could be, you know, we could always use more funding for social impact. And so I think it could be a, a positive thing to, to mm -hmm. start sending some ethical uh, revenue your way. Um, there's one, there's one last, uh, I guess, analytics report that I want to show to you guys. And it's just because it's the one that I think is the coolest on, on the Gitcoin network. So one of my big ideas is that, is that in the future, we're not going to all just work for one employer. Um, we're going to, uh, you know, hopefully if platforms like Gitcoin have, um, a, a say on the future of work, we're going to work in what's called a mesh network of jobs. So basically, um, we can all work for each other. And um, basically, the, the what you're looking at right here is a visualization of all of the transactions that have happened on the Gitcoin network from March uh, 1st, 2020 to March 23rd, 2020. So um, these are all the transactions that have happened in the month of March. And basically, if you zoom in, you can see some usernames right here. So this user, um, uh, by P89 has done transactions with it looks like two or three other users and each edge in this graph is a transaction that they've done with another user on the platform and each node is a user on the platform. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of quite interested in um, you can imagine like it, it 30 years ago when you had a corporation that had a monopoly on your employment that everyone would just be kind of central around around one node in the, in the network. What I'm quite interested in is, you know, how does this change the the social aspects of the network if everyone just starts working for each other on Gitcoin? You're kind of like having a more promiscuous economic relationship with other people out there. And we've seen these this sort of network get more distributed over time as the Gitcoin network has grown. So um, still trying to kind of make sense of the economic relationships that are being formed on, on Gitcoin, but having a graph network is quite a cool way to, to look at it. So, and that's basically, um, that represents funding flows from one user to another. Exactly, yeah. Um, is that particular graph, is that directed? Um, I didn't see any arrows. Yeah, it also, the data underneath of it is directed. I haven't figured out how to hack the graphing library to actually display that on there, but yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm on there. I'm, I'm probably the biggest whale on the platform. I'm the one that's like the central node right now, but I'm hoping that uh, it'll get more distributed over time. Yeah, it's an interesting idea. So to your point, like in, in a traditional company model, you would basically have, um, you could model out all of the employee fee, you know, payments, right? Um, mm -hmm from in, in actually different ways, right? You could, you could even do it by department and things like that, but, but yeah, uh, certainly it's like one a, corporation, right? Yeah. Like an org chart. Um, yeah. This is one of the themes that we talk about in blockchain is, you know, what do we do as, as we move from the industrial era to the information age era, are we going to move from companies being the vehicle through which we organize our labor to more networks and protocols being the, uh, the, the mechanism through which we organize. And um, it's kind of a fun sci-fi e idea. I'm not sure I totally buy it yet and I'm on the bleeding edge, but that'll be my big thought that I'll leave you guys with since we're out of time. 
All right. Well, thank you for jo joining, Kevin. That was amazing. Um, and thank you for the journey through your, uh, your experience. Okay. Thank, thank you, guys. You. Thank you all for listening very diligently. Thank you. And thank you. Uh, I'll see you around. Good luck with your, your startups you. and your agencies and everything you're doing. Thanks for joining, Kevin. Thank you. All right. So bye. Much. Bye, York. Thank you for having me. Bye. All right. So I'm going to stop that recording and then I'll start again after we take a break um, for the second half. Uh, stop.